and a person has been arrested after a car hit the main gates of Downing Street in central London. Uh, you can see a picture of it there. This all happened around half an hour ago. There are no reports of any injuries. The man's been arrested on suspicion of criminal damage and dangerous driving. Uh, joining me now is Talk, to you, uh, Talk TV and Radio's political editor, Peter Cardwell. Hi, Peter. Hi, Vanessa. Good to have you here. Obviously, this news has only just broken. I don't think we yet know who the man is or why he did what we think he did. No, we don't know yet. What we do know is what looks like, from the pictures and the video that I've seen, uh, it looks like a three-door hatchback silver car. Yep. So it's swerved or deliberately, perhaps, we don't know, drove into the gates of Downing Street. Now, there are sort of temporary gates that are movable, silver ones that you can see there in the photograph. And then there are the big, uh, more permanent structure there, the black gates. They've been there since 1989. There was actually a whole debate at the time about whether to actually block off the street. But what has happened is that someone has driven in. Uh, this is, of course, one of the most secure streets in the world. Yeah. Uh, it's near the Cenotaph, which we're very familiar with in terms of Remembrance Day. And what they've done is they've blocked, the police have blocked off the entire Whitehall, which is where a lot of government departments are. One of the main streets in Westminster is completely blocked off at the moment. The man has been arrested on those two uh, suspected charges, as you say. And that's one of the few places in this country where you're not allowed a peaceful protest, isn't it? Or indeed any kind of protest. That's right. You can protest against uh, uh, directly across the road. There's a specific area outside the Ministry of Defence that is there for that protest. But if this person was protesting, this was not the place to do it. And unsurprisingly, heavily armed officers who guard the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, both of whom with their families, live in Downing Street as well as the 400 or so staff that work in Downing Street. Mm -hmm. Well, those armed officers uh, swooped very, very quickly, arrested the man. There doesn't certainly no reports of any explosion or any major damage done, of course, and those gates are there to withstand a lot of uh, pressure, certainly even a car driving into them. And even to get into Downing Street, you need to go through airport style security. We've both been in yes. at various points, Vanessa, so you know that. Um, so really, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of damage done apart from that uh, alleged criminal damage damage and certainly the dangerous driving that happened. So this could have been an accident, it could be a protest, it could be some form of attempted terrorist attack. We just don't know at the moment. What we do know though is that, that geographically the way that Downing Street is set out, it's not as some people might imagine it would be if somebody deliberately drove into your garden gate, yes. which would, could it very easily end up with them driving right into your front room or into yes. your front door or into your house. That's not the layout of Downing Street, is it? So driving That's into right. those gates yeah. doesn't mean that that car was about to propel itself right into the kitchen where the Prime Minister could have been having a cup of coffee. Well, it's exactly. Kind of and thing, and way it? before anybody could have got to the Prime Minister, if he was in fact in Downing Street, which we don't know whether he was or no. not, we, uh, we, can, uh, we know that they would have had to get through the temporary gates, the main gates, the structure that's been there since 1989, yeah. uh, and also a big, uh, a sort of a, a big steel uh, barrier that comes out, uh, comes actually up from the road, which can be put up and brought down, and other bollards that are taken, uh, taken uh, sort of apart and put back together by an electronic mechanism yes. for any car to go up the road itself, to say nothing of the many dozens of armed officers that were there. So between any potential danger, we don't know whether this was danger or not, but any potential danger, and the Prime Minister and Chancellor of this country, country, mm -hmm. lots and lots of security, and even the, even the main gates weren't breached. Of course they were breached in 1991 when the IRA had a mortar attack against John Major that damaged the building, and they didn't quite know what to do with John Major at that stage. They put him in a, in a cupboard at one stage because they didn't quite know what was happening. The security protocols will have been developed hugely since then. Rishi Sunak will have presumably been put into a strong room. We saw some cars, there's also some footage of cars leaving Downing Street very, very soon after that. I wouldn't be surprised if the Prime Minister was taken out of Downing Street just in case there was any sort of follow-up incident. Yeah. But as I say, we don't know. This could be an accident. It could be just somebody swerved in, lost control of their car or whatever. Whitehall is a street that many, many thousands of cars go up and down every day. Absolutely. But if people are wondering about the location, where the car hit the gates and all of that kind of thing, it'll be very familiar to people um, when they've seen, for example, a Prime Minister come out and give a speech at a lectern yes. just outside the front door. So you yes. can see from those, from what we all remember of that, how yeah. far the gates are from so, the actual so I I would say, what would you say, Vanessa, about 100 yards, yes. something like that? Yes. So where the Prime Minister is standing at that lectern, all the uh, press going in, but even, I mean, I go into Downing Street quite often as mm -hmm. a political 
of journalists and even for me to get through, even though I've been vetted and I've got my hard pass and Parliament has looked into me and all the rest of it, uh, I still would have to go through airport style security to go through and surrender my bag and all the rest of it. So mm -hmm. there is quite a lot of security even as you go in, even as someone who's been vetted previously. There are, of course, as I say, about 400 people who work in Downing Street who go in and out. There are lots of entrances and exits. But in terms of getting a vehicle onto Downing Street, it really is just through those gates. There's no other way to do it. So just to reiterate, we don't know who it is and we don't know why they did it, if indeed they did it deliberately at all. That's right. We don't know if it was meant to be some kind of terror attack. We don't know if it's just stop oil. We don't know if it's some maverick person doing something on their own or if it was an accident. We don't know any of that yet. But what we do know is that anyone doing it will have known that their car was going to crash into this barrier, this big metal gate thing that, as you say, moves around and everything else, and that they would make very little impact on anyone. So it's a very yeah. peculiar course of um, course of action, isn't it? When you know that you're not really going to cause any real damage. In fact, the damage that's going to be done is going to be to you and your car. And we don't know, there don't seem to be any uh, any banners or anything no. that indicates who is in this car. And this, uh, again, I mean, as I say, we just don't know, but it could have been an accident. You could in theory get up to i mean i'm sure it's a 30 mile an hour zone but you could get a little bit of speed up if you're driving up that uh, very famous street whitehall mm -hmm. and then if you swerved in either deliberately or uh, by accident there could be a bit of an impact but as the uh, pictures show us those gates were just going nowhere essentially and the police very very quickly arrested this man okay well we will certainly will bring you uh, any information about this as it breaks uh, as the afternoon and the program unfolds but let's talk now about the top news story of the day which is the immigration figures and these are the figures for legal migration not illegal we're not talking about the boats here we're talking about people primarily who've come from ukraine and hong kong we understand that's right so about 606,000 net migration that's people who've left the country and come in take one away from the other and you've got about 606,000 extra people in the country now about 200,000 of them are from ukraine but 52,000 of them are from hong kong and the rest are people who've come here for work for family or for other reasons this is a big challenge to the government because they have said continuously really since david cameron time that they want to get migration, net migration, down. David Cameron said he wanted it in the tens of thousands. Boris Johnson said he wanted it under half a million, uh, sorry, under 250,000. And Rishi Sunak has said he wanted it under half a million. None of those targets have been no, achieved. 606,000. Yeah. And yet, the scenario and the perspective seems to be far more complicated than that, doesn't it? So many pundits are saying, from all different political persuasions really, that we need these people to come because we need them for our workforce, we need them for our economy, and that the country is by no means united or indeed adamantly convinced that we don't need legal migrants here. It's definitely something that I think most people would accept. To some degree, you need some form of migration if you want to grow your economy. The problem is if it's too much and if there's pressure on services like GPs, like schools and so on, if housing, for example, another huge issue we talk about, if you're going to bring in half over half a million people every year extra, well, that's going to put a pressure on services but at the same time we do have 1.1 million job vacancies we have 1.3 million people who are out of work some people say why can't they fill them well it's not a like for like skills comparison there and also it's a question of who's leaving the country are there doctors leaving the country to go to Australia or New Zealand for example for a better life where they're paid better for better conditions we're going to go back now to our breaking news story and that is the story of the car that has collided with the gates of number 10 Downing Street and actually for the first time, we can show you the pictures. We have the footage of the car hitting the gate. So you see that silver car, the hatchback, driving along Whitehall. You can see that very clearly. And that's all we can really see. All we have after that is just the footage of um, a still photograph of the car. There it is, smashed up into the gates. That's it. And a man has been arrested. Um, and Peter Cardwell, a regular visitor, of course, to 10 Downing Street. I've been fortunate enough to be there uh, as a guest several times myself as well. And certainly anybody who aims a car at number 10 Downing Street knows what they're going to get. And that is nowhere near number 10 Downing Street, are they? Well, uh, to me, that looks pretty deliberate from what I can see yeah, there. I mean, that's coming. I, I, I wasn't sure whether to come up the street. You can see the black taxi there or whether it was coming across. So it was coming across with a the cenotaph there to the left left of the car, it looks as if it's driving directly and deliberately into the Downing Street gate. Seemed to hesitate a little bit there. You see just, just sort of a little bit slowing down there, mm. then straight into it. So there is clearly some sort of 
Uh, there appears to be, anyway, to me, from to the naked eye, looking at that footage for the first time, there appears to be some sort of deliberate way in which that has happened. This doesn't someone whose car is out of control, no, for example. No, it doesn't, it doesn't at all seem to be out of control. It's driving very deliberately. Yeah. You can see focused and targeted, plus not pursued by any other vehicles, yes. not in mud in any traffic. There are no cyclists getting tangled up with the car. It's by itself entirely on the road, and it's making a beeline directly for the gates of Number 10 Downing Street. But if you've just joined us on the programme, Welcome to you. Good to have your company. Let me reiterate what's just happened. Breaking news in the last few minutes that a car, a silver hatchback car, has driven and to all intents and purposes from what we can observe from the footage deliberately into the gates of Number 10 Downing Street. And therein hangs a tale, really, because these gates are not like the gates of Number 5 Cherry Tree Lane or the gates of any semi or normal house that you might see in this country. The gates are gates, you might say, to use a, a phrase taken from family law, um, several gates removed from the actual property, aren't they? The gates yes, are they, gates to gates to gates, really. Yes, they're, they're gates to get into the street rather than to get into the property yes. itself. Yeah, it seems to have come up, I'm just looking at a map here on my phone, it seems to have come up a side street there, just mm -hmm. beside the, um, the Ministry of Defence, uh, just past the Cenotaph, really. So it will be around those memorials to people like Viscount Slim and, and Montgomery and mm -hmm. Allenbrook and so on, straight into Downing Street, uh, the, the gates there. So this does look like a deliberate act. Obviously, it's hard to say. You don't know exactly what's happening or what's going through the mind of the person who's there. Yes. But this is not someone who's swerved off a road. This is not someone who's, whose car appears in any way to be out of control. No, as far as our observations show, and anybody watching this uh, can see it clearly, and I'll describe it for those who are either listening or, uh, or, or taking this show through the app, you can see a silver hatchback car driving along Whitehall and the road is absolutely empty apart from the car. There's nothing else to put the car off course whatsoever and the car is aiming directly at the gates of 10 Downing Street. But the crucial thing here is that the gates are several gates removed from the actual property. So were you to go through those gates into which that car we think has deliberately collided, you're still nowhere near the door of number 10, are you? No, you're not. And actually a car that looks like that, it looks like a sort of silver hatchback, looks like a three door to me in terms of what I can see. I mean, there's no way that car is going to get anywhere near no. the gates or the, the door of 10 Downing Street, especially being driven at the speed that we saw there in the footage. There's no way that it would have the force to get through. In fact, I would imagine there are very few cars that would have the force and especially slowing down there uh, as just the footage we're looking at here. We can see it slowing down yes. before going into the gates. So there just doesn't seem to be the force there, which begs the question yet again, Vanessa, mm. as to what on earth it was doing and why. Yes, I mean, you can see the car bouncing off the gate because the gate, obviously, incredibly sturdy, yep. made of steel, yep. not the kind of gate that you can make much of a dent in or indeed drive through or break down. Absolutely. That, that makes the whole enterprise, if indeed it's deliberate, which we think it is, it looks as if it is, most bewildering, doesn't it? Because it's you really wonder peculiar. what was the perpetrator hoping to achieve by effectively you know, admiring his car in the gates of 10 Downing Street, not really, thank goodness, wreaking very much damage, thank heaven for that, of course, but trying to do what? If it, What kind of point do we assume is trying to be made here? Well, we don't know, and in terms of what is actually achieved, of course we're talking about it, but we don't know the identity of the man who's been no. arrested. We don't know he's been arrested on suspicion of criminal damage and reckless driving. But, you know, was there any protest behind this? Was there any point to it? Was the person trying to make a point? Around Downing Street at all times, there are, well, at almost all times, there are generally people looking through the gates, tourists taking photographs, often people protesting across the road. There's a particular place across the road where you can protest. But in terms of actually trying to get in in some way, well, you just can't do that because no. there are armed, heavily armed police officers. It is one of the most secure streets in the world. And really, in terms of this, in terms of what that car could have actually done, well, not a huge amount, really, no, because not. it is so guarded. But in a way, how how fortunate that is, isn't it, that we that, 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 that really, whatever this protest is, is severely limited by the collision of car and gate to, yeah. to almost nothing very much at all. No one's been injured, thank goodness. Nobody's been hurt. There doesn't seem to be any real security risk or anything else, which makes makes it seem like a very futile yeah. gesture, even more futile, rendered even more pointless by the fact that we don't know who did it. So if they're doing it to draw attention to any particular cause or any kind of, uh, um, I don't know, patriotic gesture, supporting some other country we don't know what it is and there could have been it could have been someone with mental health problems you know we we, we we just don't know there are lots of reasons why a person could have chosen 
to have done that. They might be making a protest about something that we know yeah, nothing about that's, that's a personal thing. So we really don't know. It is interesting, though, that it has happened and that they've chosen to do it in that way. Yes. And certainly they were always going to be arrested. Those police officers were always going to swoop and happen. And we remember, of course, PC Keith Palmer, who was killed in Parliament. Um, on their, their All other right, let's, let's go to uh, Talk TV's political editor, uh, Kate McCann, who is on the line. I think she's at 10 Downing Street. Kate, hello. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? Yes, I'm all right. But obviously, I, you know, I last saw you just a few minutes ago live here in the studio. You've only been gone a few minutes and we have uh, a car colliding with the gates of 10 Downing Street. Is there any light you can shed on this? Well, I can tell you what I can see right now. I am stood basically where you can see on that footage that the car comes from very slowly from the other side of the road. I'm stood in the pen over here, directly opposite Downing Street. Now, the pen houses protesters of very different sorts. They have been here for quite a long time. It's a fairly sort of well-recognised uh, group of people, different uh, protests. They were all here all afternoon, and nobody seems to have seen where this car came from. Directly opposite Downing Street is the car park for the Ministry of Defence. There are lots of cars parked up there right now. Gates are literally opposite Downing Street, where this car looks to have come out of. Quite hard to understand how that would have happened, given that that is clearly a government building. Uh, you'd have to be vetted to even park your car in that uh, car park. But at the moment, what we can see is police officers are looking through the boot of that car. They are, uh, you know, armed officers. Downing Street still closed off Whitehall, still closed off uh, right to the top of Whitehall near Trafalgar Square and right down to the very bottom uh, near Parliament Square. They're going through the contents of the boot of that car at the moment. Now, it's hard to see uh, what they're looking through. It looks like they're looking through various different bags for life. They're going through the contents uh, very carefully. Uh, there were lots of police cars uh, parked here just before. Some of them have left. There's still a significant police presence, as you would expect. Uh, armed officers who are always on, on guard in Downing Street. As Peter was just saying, I mean, it's, it's one of the most secure addresses in the country. And this car, as you both just said, it didn't make any particular impact with those gates. Interestingly, there are bollards on one side of the fence. So whoever this person is has driven through from the past the bollards and, and into the bit where you would usually drive up and then wait to be given access to Downing Street by the officers on this side of the fence. You then go through and on the other side of the fence, your car will be checked for so anything underneath it. It gets a thorough check before it's allowed to drive in. But as I say at the moment, that cordon is still uh, on in Downing Street. Officers on either side of the fence currently going through the contents of this car, which is sort of small silver car. It doesn't look to have really made any impact with the gate that I can see from, from this angle. Kate, okay, thank you very much indeed. Let's uh, go now to the Labour MP, Thangham Debonair, MP for Bristol West and Shadow Leader of the House. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Thangham. Obviously, uh, whatever we were thinking of talking about to you, I think, was uh, uh, migration and, and the figures has been supplanted in uh, the news agenda by this collision oh. into the gates of 10 Downing Street. What do you make of this? Obviously, you spend a great deal of your time there. It's, um, it's, it's a, a, an astounding thing to see. It is. I mean, I don't spend yet a great deal of my time in 10 Downing Street, but I it, obviously the, the sight of it brings back the memory of those awful events of 22nd of March 2017 when PC Keith Palmer lost his life so tragically, defending us from someone doing the same thing to Parliament. I am relieved to hear that so far, at least, there seems to be nobody hurt, uh, which is good, and that the police are um, may, have made an arrest. Um, but obviously, it just it just highlights the fact that that we we do have people who want to do our democracy harm, and we also have the protection of the police who are constantly uh, vigilant to try and protect our ability to go about our business, trying to do things for the country. Uh, and I'm obviously very very distressed to see these scenes, but I'm I'm relieved to hear that nobody so far has been I hear has been hurt. Do you, do you, as you go about your business in Parliament, as you walk in, as you walk out, do you feel a very present and constant risk to security, to safety? Are you aware that, you know, everywhere you look, there might be somebody who wants to target either you as an MP or the building or the edifice itself in some way? It, security is a priority and, you know, we, we, we are constantly vigilant. I think there's always more we can do. Um, I, in my role as shadow leader of the House of Commons, I meet regularly with the head of security to be briefed. Uh, I also have a role in, in helping to encourage you know, everybody on the estate to take security seriously. And that also includes cyber security. But yes, 
entrances are guarded and rightly so we have various security measures which obviously you'll understand i won't go into the detail of no. um, but security is everybody's business in parliament this isn't a party political matter it's a matter of defending not only um, mps and peers but of course the thousands of staff who work there every single day and above all defending our democracy and our right to meet freely debate make decisions scrutinize the government it really matters that we're able to do that without fear of incidents like this and as i said i, I am relieved to hear nobody seems to have been hurt but it's obviously concerning and, and i and i expect that the police will be looking into what the circumstances were and it's good to hear they've managed to make an arrest quickly I mean, it, it certainly is concerning, isn't it? And, and obviously the questions arising now are possible motivations for this yes. kind of action, which I think we can all see is doomed before it's even started. I mean, you know that a car, an ordinary sort of silver hatchback car, isn't going to make, as Kate McCann, our reporter on the site, said, any kind of dent in gates of that robust sturdiness. You know, they're absolutely solid, aren't they? Rock solid, really. Very, very heavy metal gates. A car's going to end up being uh, concertinaed on gates like that, and whoever drives into them must surely know that. Well, you'd have thought so, but clearly this person, from what we can see in the pictures on, on your screen, on what you're showing us on our screens, uh, someone clearly did decide that it was worth a go. Now, I, I mean, it, I, I, it's hard to understand why they would do that, but it was also hard to understand why someone would try to do that um, back in March 2017. Um, I... I I can only say that I think it's really important that we respect the fact that it's, it's, it's sad that we need this level of security. But unfortunately, when we have people trying to do these things, it does reinforce the need for that security. And my respect for those who, who come to work every day to keep us and democracy safe. And the thousands of people who come onto the parliamentary estate and to government buildings every day, members of the public who come to see what we do, it increases my respect for them even more. And it also reminds us all, all of us in the parliamentary community, that security is paramount and we do always need to be vigilant so that we can go about our democratic business, our lawful business, as people wish us to do. Here, here. what are your memories of, of March 2017? The, the horror of it, to be honest. Yes, tell, um, can, you, can you describe what, what, it, what it was like and what happened, where yes, you were we, at the time? Just, just so I people realise, really, the enormity of this kind of thing. The, 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 not just the, the symbolism of it, which is pretty shattering in itself, but the reality of it when you're really fearful and when it's actually happening. The reality of it was was dreadful i mean for me mostly the horror of it is the fact that that we we quickly learned that a police officer had lost his life defending the parliamentary community and and that was the the worst thing about it we were voting at the time so we were in the voting lobbies surrounding the chamber and it was quickly obvious that something had happened uh, we do have robust procedures and as it happened i'd been briefed on those as at the point then i was a a whip an opposition whip so we'd had a security briefing weeks before then so i was aware of what might happen um we went through you know what, what was a, called a lockdown it's a different sort of lockdown from the one we had in covid and we had to spend several hours with you know, just getting news on our phones and our iPads to see what was going on. Um, but the, the paramount emphasis on security, it was sorely tested. Yes. I think that we showed that when it comes to a crisis, it is, it is frightening, obviously, for the many staff. I mean, my, I had a member of staff who was much, much closer to the incident at the time, just by sheer coincidence, than I was. And, you know, had been really terrified. And I think there were many people who, 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 who experienced that and who were, in effect, witnesses to what happened. But my, the main thing I will always take away, and, and I frequently stop by the monument to Keith Palmer, is, is the fact that somebody came to work that day, said goodbye to their family and never went home because he believed, as a police officer, in defending democracy and defending people's rights to assemble freely and the members of the public to come and watch us. And that's awful because the person whose name I make a point of not remembering, the person who did it, mm. um, had only evil intent. He killed other people. I mean, let's not remember, it wasn't just a police officer. Yes. It was also people who were just crossing Westminster Bridge on their way here. I also had a school in Parliament that day, primary school children, who I was 
so worried about because I knew they'd only just left the parliamentary estate to cross that very bridge to go to be on, on the London Eye. And my first concern was for their safety. And I was relieved when I heard that they had only just made it across, but thankfully were unaware. And I, I went to the school the next day because, of course, they then heard about what happened mm. to talk to those school children. They were puzzled. They they wanted to know. They asked me, why does this happen? And, and it's quite hard to answer them why somebody would have such a hatred towards ordinary people who were just seeing London, seeing the sights. They were just having a day out, as well as a, a, a man, a, a very brave man who came to work to protect people. That was very hard to explain to primary school children. And it was very hard. It, it remains, I think, for me and, and for others who were there, hard to understand why someone would want to do that but also that our respect for those people who protect us just grows and grows. Absolutely. I mean, uh, looking at, at what's happened today, I think maybe this will signal and signify something pretty important to the world, actually, because obviously this, these, this footage is going to be flashed on screens all over the yeah. world as, you know, a car drives into the gates of 10 Downing Street. It's a huge story. It's a breaking story. It's going to get massive coverage. But but I think it will show, let's hope it proclaims, that Downing Street is safe, that yeah. the, the measures in place, the gates, the barriers, the, 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 the security, the armed police and everything else are a bastion of safety and do form an envelope of safety around the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and everybody who works there and the edifice of 10 Downing Street itself. Uh, quite. And I hope that does that is the message that people take. I would also like um, anybody who has that evil intent towards democracy and the people who work in it, the, the, the men and women who, who work in, in our parliament, in our government, I'd like them to know that they will never defeat us, yes. ever. We're proud of our democracy. I'm so proud of living in a country where we get to choose our representatives and they freely make decisions and can be scrutinised with, yes, sometimes robust language, but never violence. We don't do that. That's not the British way. And I feel really strongly and, and, and patriotically proud of the fact that we will always defend our democracy. We will always defend the right of British people to be able to vote for who they want to represent them and then to vote us out, but never to use violence as a way of resolving our differences. That's not what we do. We have democracy for a reason, and I, and I hope it's as well as a reminder to anyone with evil intent that they will not succeed, but also to all of us to treasure our democracy. It's a precious thing. It really matters, and, here, here. and it matters to me personally. Here, here, Thagnam, thank you so much for that. Listen, why don't you just <laughs> wait if you've got the moment to do so and listen to our political editor, Peter Cardwell, because he has some information and just take the story on a little bit further, I believe. Peter, what have you been able to discover? Well, Vanessa, as I've been sitting here on the sofa, I've been in contact via WhatsApp with some people here inside Downing Street. Yes. They were temporarily in lockdown when this happened oh. over about oh, just over an hour ago. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, was in 10 Downing Street. Oh. He's not anymore. He was taken away very quickly once the lockdown lockdown lifted. He has other engagements to go to, but he was taken out the back door of Downing Street, which is actually on a lower level, and then taken out uh, the, the sort of road at the back, which is called Horse Guards. So everybody's fine. There's no issues, no injuries, as we know, and the car didn't get anywhere nearer. It looks like a Kia car, um, uh, the brand of car, and it is a three-door car. So we're not talking about an SUV. We're not talking about yeah. a big, strong, uh, a, a, you know, very robust car here. We're talking about quite a small car, and the man who's been arrested. There are some photographs of him uh, cir circulating and handcuffs being uh, dragged off by police. But of course, we don't know his identity and we don't know his intent. But certainly the people I've been speaking to inside Downing Street are safe and well. Everybody's OK. Well, that's very good news. Thank them. That's very, very good news. I'm assuming there's a very strict protocol uh, about what happens in these sorts of uh, uh, events. Thagnum really isn't there, this, this removing of the Prime Minister from the vicinity immediately. 17, but I mean, I wish to just just emphasise, and I hope I've not given this impression that, of course, we don't yet know what the motive was, and we've no idea at all what the circumstances are, and it's just really important that we let the police do their job now, investigate what's actually happened, and yes, a good reminder of the fact we do have protocols to protect the prime minister and our members of government and parliament. We, we heard um, that in 2017, or, or when when there was attack aimed uh, aimed at John Major, that. Um, that he was, he was secreted in some kind of secure, that was described as a cupboard, but I'm assuming that in 10 Downing Street there are safe spaces, by which I mean reinforced and locked and that kind of a thing, 
in the event that such a thing as this should occur? I mean, I, I don't know the detail and you wouldn't expect me to share that with the public if I did. Um, but I do know that certainly in 2017, um, the, the, the prime minister was made secure as quickly as possible. But also it was important to show that no matter what, no matter what, what whatever the motive of this person, as in 2017, we shall continue with our democratic business. The prime minister is the prime minister no matter where he is. I'm glad that he's secure. I'm glad that nobody was hurt. But it's important for our democracy that we are allowed to continue and that people understand that we will carry on doing our jobs no matter what. Uh, usually when there are incidents like this, and it is, as you say, absolutely fortunate and, and, and we can only be uh, full of gratitude and relief that nobody's been hurt, even the perpetrator in this instance. Nobody's been shot, mm. nobody's been injured. Thank goodness for that. And even the gates seem to be relatively unscathed. But certainly when these sorts of things happen, the, the mantra you normally hear repeated ad nauseam is lessons will be learnt. I wonder if, if you can see at a glance any lessons that should be learned today or whether you think lessons have been learned as a result of the last attacks on 10 Downing Street and Westminster Bridge, as you quite rightly say. And it's clear by today's result that we've learned the lessons we need to learn. The security services will always review everything that happens. They will review our defences. They are strong, smart people who will work very hard. And I, I know that the head of security for the parliamentary estate and the governmental buildings will be working very hard to do that. I'm not a security expert, but I am. Uh, I have good faith in the fact that whatever lessons need to be learned. I mean, as you've said, this person did not get through. Mm. So there clearly are security measures which are able to defend us from this type of attack now but you know nobody's ever going to be complacent we, we have regular reminders in the parliamentary estate of, of threats to us and there are regular reviews and I, I know that the security the security staff will be doing that and I'm sure they'll be doing it right now. Langham, thank you very much indeed. That's Langham Debonair there, the Labour MP, responding to the breaking news story. It only happened a few moments ago uh, that uh, a car slammed into the gates of 10 Downing Street. Let's go to the security correspondent, Will Geddes, who obviously uh, is familiar with these sorts of events and occasions. Um, Will, it seems as if the gates are so robust that that Kia, which is what we think the car is, uh, three-door hatchback Kia, didn't stand a chance? No, it didn't stand a chance at all, Vanessa. You know, what they have in place at Downing Street and other sort of very key locations is what we call threat vehicle mitigation measures. You know, one of the biggest threats potentially over and beyond a, a suicide bomber or a random individual that obviously tries to attack people on the street is vehicle-borne attacks, whether that be as a platform for individuals to uh, disembark from and launch their attack. Ah, oh, have we lost Will? I think we've lost you, Will. Yes, Will will Four. get us. Yeah, have we got you back? No, he's fallen off the line. That's a shame. We'll try and get him back. So Peter Caldwell is here with me as we try to decipher what's been going on. And we know very clearly, Peter, that a car slammed into the gates of 10 Downing Street. It looks very much from the footage that we've seen as if that was deliberate. Yes, indeed. And I've actually just been on the Kia website, the type of car it appears to be anyway. We don't know for sure. But certainly from the, all the v v uh, footage and videos and so on that are circulating online of this car, it looks like a sort of mid-range car, a three-door hatchback, a Kia Rio, uh, which is um, about £16,000 new. Mm. So when it goes into those gates, I mean, those, these are wrought iron, extremely expensive, robust gates, and it's just not going to get through. And we saw from the footage that we were looking at earlier that it sort of hesitated, it kind of braked uh, before or broke just before it went uh, towards Downing Street, just that final few metres towards those gates. And, of course, there were the steel gates beforehand, the removable gates that the police would be moving before the big steel black gates, that uh, the wrought iron black gates that, of course, everybody is familiar with. They've been there since 1989. There was a big controversy at the time about whether they should actually be put up. And until 1989, you could just walk up Downing Street. You couldn't drive a car up there since the 70s. But there was a lot more access than there is today. Really, it's only uh, people who work in the government offices there, the politicians, their advisors, 
journalists and uh, policemen who and women who are there on the streets, really, because it's just not a, a place that people can go up. And yeah, usually, not a thoroughfare, not a thoroughfare. Just, you don't oh. stroll through it on your way to somewhere else. You're either going there or you're not going there. That's, that's right. Yeah. And, and they have often a lot of tourists and so on who are there trying to take photos through it, although it's not a particularly good angle. So to have a, a run at it would be a tricky thing. And of course, you have so many heavily armed police officers, especially trained police officers who look after Parliament, who look after diplomatic buildings as well, the embassies right around London and Downing Street as well. So Rishi Sunak, as we know, was in there. He was removed very quickly, went out the back gate in his convoy. He, of course, will be have been involved in that very brief lockdown that happened as well. And as I said a few minutes ago, I've been talking via WhatsApp to a couple of people who are inside that building. They say everybody's fine, nobody's shaking or anything. The police did their job, they did what they were supposed to do, and everybody was safe, so no injuries. But this man driving the car has been arrested on suspicion of okay. careless driving and criminal damage. Thank you, Peter. We're going to go back to Will Geddes, the security expert now, but I tell my team what I'd like to do if they can organise this for the programme. I'd like to talk to Peter Blexley or one of the senior police officers that we normally... Uh, talk to on the show and 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 discuss what will be going on now with the person that they have arrested. I'd like to know what sorts of lines of questioning take place, you know, how quickly they manage to ascertain who the person is and what the person's motivation was. Because at the point of talking to you now, as this is pretty much breaking news only happened around about half an hour ago that a car crashed into the gates of 10 Downing Street. We don't know who the person is that did it, who the perpetrator is, or why. So we don't know if it's somebody uh, with some kind of terrorist intent, somebody making some kind of protest, somebody with mental health issues, somebody who's trying to stand for something or other. We have no idea. But certainly if they were trying to do it for publicity or for the sake of protest, they picked a peculiar way of doing it because they haven't advertised who they are or why they doing it. If you look at the Just Stop All protesters, they always make it very clear with signage, with what they're wearing, with what they tell uh, the watching media that they are doing a certain thing because they represent Just Stop Oil, so nobody can be in any doubt. Normally, terrorists do something pretty similar so that you know what it is that they're trying to achieve. But this person has done it in the most peculiar way and also chosen a most peculiar way of doing things when you know that he's going to be thwarted before he's even started because the car is flimsy and the gates are not. So let's talk to Will Geddes, the security expert. We lost you, Will. You fell off the line. But what were you saying to us just before? So I don't know how much you caught, Vanessa, but I mean, certainly the points you were just making were very astute as always. I Thank mean, you. fundamentally, the protection around Downing Street is incredibly robust. The actual gates that Peter was talking about are actually reinforced. And not only are there gates, but there are also other vehicle threat mitigation measures. You know, one of the biggest concerns is a vehicle potentially driving up, which could be loaded with an explosive. And it could be, you know, what we generally term as a VBIED. Now, in this instance, looking at the approach of the vehicle, and I can only obviously base my speculations, my analysis yes. on what we've seen. The approach by the vehicle was very, very gradual. It wasn't a sped up sort of approach where they accelerated into the gate with the intention of actually uh, making contact. And as your point very, very clearly made, you know, if this was a protest, there would be some sort of banners, some sort of decals, something to indicate that this was a protest in order of some particular group. Yes. Um, one of your correspondents earlier said, you know, there are a lot of protesters outside. I'm sure they were as surprised as the police officers when this vehicle collided with the goats. I, I, I wondered, and this is, you, you'll explain to me why this hasn't happened, but I wondered why there wasn't more caution about whether there might be some explosives contained within the vehicle. So I wondered why there wasn't more cordoning off, vacating the area, you know, and then the sorts of for, uh, parts of the police force who exist to, to, you know, to detonate various devices taking uh, some kind of role in all of this. But there hasn't doesn't seem to have been a fear that there might be some kind of explosive inside the vehicle. Is that because they just assumed if it didn't go off on, um, on contact, then it won't go off? Is that it? Well, there is that absolutely viable sort of uh, uh, analysis by the police officers actually who are stationed there. And uh, again, as one of your, your previous guests was saying, the police officers there are very, very highly trained. They're not your standard police officers. These will form part of the royalty and specialist protection that you and I were talking about the other day. And they will have had training to identify, assess in a very dynamic, very quick way what kind of threat they were facing. Now, I would presume 
that they made an assessment, a very immediate assessment on the driver, his condition, his uh, status, obviously when that vehicle impacted. It didn't impact particularly hard, Vanessa. So I don't think he would have necessarily been concussed by the impact. Mm. So he was probably intelligible to be able to talk to and to uh, communicate with. Now, my, my feeling is, and I mean, I could be wrong. I have been in the past, but this isn't a terrorism event. This is a driver error incident. Motivated by what? We don't know yet. We'll probably find out. But at the moment, the police officers uh, certainly will be going through this individual's background intrinsically quickly. There's a fast track into the domestic security services, MI5, yeah. of any individual's name, which will be cross-referenced against a list of names that they have, both as priority targets or subjects of interest, and those that are on the lower echelons. Does that mean you're implying that this might be likely to be somebody possibly with either mental health issues, some kind of personal grudge, that kind of um, individual who's not affiliated to any, any uh, particular either terrorist cause or, or indeed just stop oil protest type cause? Do you think it might be somebody on their own individual mission to do something pertaining to their own life and their own personal problems? Is that what it's looking like to yeah. you? Yeah. That, that's how I'm feeling it right now, Vanessa. Yes. You know, yes. certainly in terms of we've seen protesters, whether it be Extinction Rebellion, yeah. Just Stop Oil, any of those guys, they have a particular modus operandi that they, they follow these days in yes. obtaining as much publicity as possible. Now, one point that you did make, which was incredibly valid, is the actual subject of the attack, which was 10 Downing Street, or mm -hmm. certainly the, 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 the middle of Whitehall there. Now, that in itself will garnish huge amounts of publicity and uh, media coverage obviously across the world everybody will immediately know that location whether they've been to the uk or not yes but i would say just looking at how the vehicle was moving certainly in terms of its speed i don't see this necessarily as a very deliberate directed premeditated attack necessarily by someone who is coherent i think this person may very possibly turn out to be someone as you assess to either have some mental health issues or is acting on their own volition, not under the banner of any direct action group or terrorist group. Well, Gerdes, thank you very much indeed. Let me go to the guest that I wanted most to have on the programme, and that's Peter Blexley, uh, former senior police officer. Uh, Peter, thank you very much indeed for joining me on the programme. Uh, you know, this is a breaking news story, and at the moment, um, many, many questions hang over almost every aspect of it, but you'll be able to answer one, I'm sure, which is this man, the perpetrator, has been arrested. What will be happening to him now? And what sorts of lines of questioning will the police embark upon as a matter of urgency? Thanks for joining me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just, I just need to correct you. I was a lowly detective, not a senior officer but very experienced in a lot of different fields. Um, yes, I've seen the images of this man being led away in handcuffs. He looks about my age, to be perfectly honest with you, from yeah. the picture that I saw. He's got a bald spot about the same size as mine and doesn't fit any kind of profile that we might have expected people from more traditional expected terrorist backgrounds to come from. He will be taken to a, a very nearby police station, quite possibly Charing Cross, which is literally just a few hundred metres away mm. from Downing Street. He will, of course, have legal representation, should he want it. He will be searched. I would imagine there are ample grounds for him having a, a, a very thorough search. And then the legal due process will follow. He will be questioned at some point, or he may be examined. What happens if somebody and I'm just merely hypothesising here, if somebody is arrested and it is suspected that they've got considerable mental health issues, mm -hmm. then, of course, a medical expert would be called in to examine them to see if they were fit to be detained. I, I can, Peter, I'm just they... going to interrupt you, Peter, just one second to say what we can now see on the screen is the footage of this individual being arrested. We haven't been able to see that before, but now we can. So we can see crowds around we can see uh people sort of congregating around to see what's going on and uh this is the footage of this individual actually actively being arrested and you've said that you think he's a similar age to you i have no idea how old you are i know you look far younger than you really are but how old are you peter um regrettably i'm 63 um yeah 
Of course, we can hear robust voices, as you would expect to come from these protection officers once a car nudges into these gates. I mean, from the images that I've seen, it looks like the airbag didn't deploy. So it was clearly a very low, uh, low impact, a very, very little damage caused, as I can see. Mm -hmm. So this is not the determined, life-threatening kind of actions from somebody we might expect hell-bent on causing carnage and taking lives. And, of course, by the way the officers dealt with the vehicle very swiftly, it was clear they didn't believe it to be containing other devices. So that might well have been information that was, a, that was extracted from the man that was arrested. It may have become blatantly obvious to the officers very, very quickly mm. that this man perhaps was acting alone, was in no shape a terrorist, and might be just making his own little personal protest about something or other. And let's face it, today's been the day when migration figures have been announced. Who knows if he's somebody disgruntled with the government and just having a having his 15 minutes of fame and trying to make his point in a very, very foolish way, I would yeah, say. Of course. So so once once he's, you know, taken to the police station, you think it might be Charing Cross, it might not, but it might. And and then what happens? Presumably he's in handcuffs, presumably he's taken for questioning if he's in a men in a fit state of mental health to seem to be robust enough to answer questions. How many uh, police officers will question him and what will the environment be like? Because we've all watched far too many police dramas and I think we all think we know what's going to be going on, but we don't necessarily. Well, once somebody enters a police station, they are, are having been arrested, they are really under the control of the custody sergeant which is a very important role defined by law. And it is the custody sergeant who overwhelmingly has the responsibility for that prisoner whilst they are in custody. And by when I say responsibility, I mean that all legal obligations are met, that the person is kept safe, so that person is not allowed to harm themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would very much be a priority if you thought somebody had a mental health issue. So the custody sergeant performs a very, very vital role. The person will, of course, be searched to ensure that they've got no articles on them with which they could harm somebody or harm themselves. They'll be asked about if they need any medication, if they take medication regularly. And uh, as, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, there will, of course, be a need for legal representation should that person want it. If they don't have their own lawyer, that they nominate, then a duty solicitor or legal representative experienced in dealing with people in police custody will be called and they, of course, will represent that client's interests in the legal sense mm -hmm. after they've had a consultation with them, so long as the custody sergeant deems that not to be a risk to anybody. Would, would you say in these sorts of circumstances, and I don't know how familiar or common these sorts of circumstances really are, that somebody deliberately drives into the gates of 10 Downing Street knowing that they're going to make zero impact and with no sorts of insignia or banner or anything else to tell you who they are, um, and, and quite clearly with no explosives on board, thank goodness. Um, but when, when somebody of that ilk is being questioned, are they would you say normally keen to say who they are and why they've done it? Because if they didn't want it to be known, they wouldn't have done it. Or can it suddenly all get very quiet and difficult to, to kind of follow if you, if, you, if you try to question them? Is there a possibility that they might just not cooperate at all and leave the officers utterly confounded as to who they are and what's going on? Well, as you quite correctly say, these are such rare circumstances. I certainly can't recall somebody driving a car into the gates of... Downing Street for many years, if at all. So it is an almost unique situation. Mm. The custody sergeant, bound by the laws of the land, will put in place all the necessary procedures. And I'm sure that the, the officers chatting amongst themselves will be very interested to know what this man's motives were, why on earth he took on this potentially very dangerous thing. Because whilst the speed of the car might only have been a few miles an hour. If you're driving that into the gates of Downing Street with all those armed police officers nearby, you are creating a hazardous situation, not potentially only for that driver, 
but for innocent members of the public who are in the vicinity. And those cops at Downing Street do like to engage with the public. They do allow them to have a peer through the gates so they can actually get to see number 10, which is about 100 yards or so from those gates. Um, and so this really was an act of considerable irresponsibility, yes. even though there's no great speed involved. Peter, thank you. Let me just talk to Peter Cardwell because I think you've got yeah, there's more just news. A slightly weird um, coincidence, and I'm sure it is a coincidence, uh -huh. but within the last number of days, there have been this sort of thing has happened in a couple of different world sites. So the White House, for example, oh. on Monday night, a man hired a U-Haul, a, a sort of moving van, to move furniture and, around and, it, and yeah. to move furniture around in, and went into the gates of uh, the White House, for example. Now he had psychiatric difficulties, he was saying all sorts of uh, things and was taken away by police and has been charged with that. And six days ago, mm. uh, someone again with psychiatric problems drove into the Vatican as well and was shot at by um, gendarme, by, by the uh, officers around there. Uh -huh. So whilst I'm not suggesting for a second that any of these are linked, it is quite weird that within the last week, three globally famous sites, the Vatican, the White House and Downing Street, have been targeted with similar sorts of incidents. I'll not say attacks because we don't know whether it's an attack or not, but certainly similar sorts of incidents. So it is, at the very least, a very strange coincidence that that has happened. That is very strange and actually seems much too great a coincidence not to have some kind of link about it because we don't, in general, hear about this. It's not a, a kind of routine thing that people are generally, are generally yeah. driving cars or vehicles into into uh, uh, enormous kind of national edifices, is it? Mm. This is no, it's unusual. not. And, and at the same time, you know, all three, nothing really happened. The You know, at the White House, for example, no Secret Service or, or, or officers or any staff of the White House were injured in any way and similarly the Vatican no one was injured there mm -hmm. either and people were just arrested and uh, the as Peter Blexley was saying you know but in, in, in this case and certainly in those cases as well the law will take its course but it is a very very strange coincidence in terms of the fact that within the last seven days those three things have happened. Very odd but but it's being suggested is it that those uh, perpetrators that they've already questioned um, mental health issues are part of it? Yes certainly the um, with the Vatican the person was taken to a psychiatric hospital uh, for example, with the White House, the person talked, uh, uh, said, you know, I'm going to kill the president, things like that, and talked about his admiration for Nazis. Uh, the, the, and there appears to be some sort of psychiatric element to that as well. But with this person, of course, who has been arrested in regard to Downing Street, we just don't know. And I'm sure detail will emerge over the past, over the next few days. But again, uh, actually, a, a second person has contacted me from inside Downing Street who I've been chatting to on WhatsApp saying, look, all's fine. We're all absolutely fine inside here. It was obviously in lockdown for a short period of time. Rishi Sunak then left. He was there in Downing Street. He's now left and uh, he's perfectly safe. OK, well, that's uh, reassuring at least. So, so the news so far, what can we tell you about what's gone on? We know that a vehicle has been driven into the gates of 10 Downing Street. Now, what that means in practice is not the same as driving them into the gates of your house or the gates of any building near you. The gates are far from the door of 10 Downing Street. And so the damage that's been done has been done primarily to the car.